far below the city of Yarnum lie the slumbering Great Ones. Known as gods by the people, they're superior beings that come from distant stars. From the Moon Presence to Mother Kos, Amygdala, Formless Udin, and Ibriadus, no two Great Ones are exactly alike. Among the most important yet understated characters is one such Great One, Ibriadus, daughter of the cosmos. Although the player can easily complete the entire game without ever meeting her, she's integral to the central plot. The blood that carries the scourge throughout Yarnum could have very likely have come from within her, after all. As you know, the Healing Church is the fountainhead of blood healing. Well, I'm a simple hunter quite unfamiliar with the ins and outs of the institution, but I have heard that the holy medium of blood healing is venerated in the main cathedral and that counselors of the old church reside in the high stratum of the cathedral ward. If you seek blood healing, and the church is willing, you should pay them a visit. With this simple dialogue, Alfred explains the workings of the healing church without even having a full understanding of it. As the player progresses throughout the story, you learn more of the healing church, the facade of a holy institution dedicated to medicine and the reality of a corrupt figurehead that uses its power to deceive, experiment on, and commit murder as we see in Kanehurst, and especially poison its people. As Alfred mentions, the Healing Church finds its roots in Bergenworth, the institute of learning that has long since been sealed away. The Bergenworth scholars dug deep below Yarnum in a feverish search for knowledge. What they find is baffling, the ancient civilization of Thumaru, Thumuru once dwelt just below the surface, and alongside them were corporeal gods, the Great Ones, hailing from far outside our world. Their signature, the Cosmic Eye Watcher Badge, reads, Badge of a member of the choir, elites of the Healing Church. The eye signifies the very cosmos. The choir stumbled upon an epiphany, very suddenly and quite by accident. Here we stand, feet planted in the earth. But might the cosmos be very near us, only just above our heads? The living deities, along with the blood they carry, are the holy medium that inspired the creation of the healing church from this group of scholars, eventually branching off even further into the secret sects of Mensis and the choir. Attire of the choir, high-ranking members of the healing church. Members of the choir are both the highest-ranking clerics of the healing church and scholars who continue the work that began at Bergenworth. Together with the Left Behind Great One, they look to the skies and search for astral signs that may lead them to the rediscovery of true greatness. Over time, Bergenworth, the Hunters, the Church, Mensis, and the Choir broke apart from one another. In fact, the Upper Cathedral Ward Key, where the Choir conducts its surreptitious work, is found on an imprisoned corpse in Yahargul, the unseen village that Mensis calls home. Ascend to Erden Chapel. From there, you will find the church workshop. As Germant suggests, the structure of the church is very much physical and connected through a single building, Uden Chapel. The choir is settled at the very top of the upper echelon of Cathedral Ward, just below are the Healing Church workshop and Uden Chapel, followed by the now abandoned Hunter's Workshop that the dream is modeled after, and finally the lowest alleys of Cathedral Ward, suggesting that they may have worked cohesively at one point. Unbeknownst to us, at the beginning of the game, the Grand Cathedral sits below the orphanage where the choir's experiments were conducted. In a traditional church, the singing choir is housed relatively unseen above the congregation just like this, their voices ringing throughout. It's the same in Bloodborne, only with much more sinister connotations. Although they're almost invisible, their impact is everywhere. Directly below the Grand Cathedral, and accessible only through an elevator headed down from the top floor, is Abriadus, daughter of the cosmos. When we first meet her in the Altar of Despair, she's hunched over in sorrow, the corpse of what appears to be Rom lying dormant before her. Could she be in mourning? She's described as being left behind. Whether this is referring to the choir, the Great Ones, or even Rom is unclear. It could easily be one or all of these. Forgotten below Yarnum without her kind, she encountered the Bergenworth scholars who dug through the catacombs and made a pact with them, establishing the choir. The holy medium Alfred mentioned, the source for Yarnum's special blood, could very likely have come from Abriatus directly. 
After becoming the church's blood mule, she's abandoned twice more on the night of the hunt. Once by the choir that fled Upper Cathedral Ward or otherwise turned into beasts after the blood moon, and then once again by Rom, who was killed by none other than you, the player character. Despite being a boss, she doesn't initiate the fight until she's under direct attack. The battle itself is formidable and fascinating. She begins by flailing her tentacles and slamming her head. As it progresses, she hurls afflicted blood at you, causing frenzy. It's interesting to note that her blood is clear once struck, indicating that she's a kin of the cosmos, but the blood she spits out is red. In spite of her initial reluctance, she's easily one of the hardest bosses in the game. Once defeated, she drops the Great East Chalice, which reads, Great chalices unlock deeper reaches of the labyrinth. The Great East Chalice became the cornerstone of the choir, the elite delegation of the Healing Church. It was also the first Great Chalice brought back to the surface since the time of Bergenworth, and allowed the choir to have an audience with Abriatus. This is the dungeon in which she was found long ago. Upon entering, the cosmic atmosphere is palpable. There, we see familiar enemies, the celestial emissaries, the brain suckers, and most notably, the celestial larvae that also lie at the base of Upper Cathedral Ward, with their heads facing collectively toward the sky. Interesting enough, they inflict frenzy with their attacks too. Ebriatus herself waits at the core in her full furiosity. The Great East Chalice and Upper Cathedral Ward are closely connected with many of the same enemies. In addition to bringing these creatures back with them to Yarnum, it's possible that the choir used them as their initial experiments with the people, the most diabolical of which is evidence in the Orphanage. Key to the Orphanage, birthplace of the choir. The Orphanage, shadowed by the Grand Cathedral, was a place of scholarship and experimentation, where young orphans became potent, unseen thinkers for the Healing Church. The choir, which would later split the Healing Church, was a creation of the Orphanage. What's chilling about all this is the use of Orphanage, which suggests that the choir took the parentless children of Yarnum under the guise of sanctuary by the Healing Church to become the victims of unspeakable experiments. The player character sees them only after they lost all their humanity and became the first boss of Upper Cathedral Ward, the Celestial Emissary. Unlike the previous patients of the research hall that seem to be willing participants who show sincere desire to see the project through to success and then ironically fail, these experiments are the result of deception. Although it's debatable as to whether Impostor Yosefka is a member of the choir, she uses many of the same tactics, misleading the hunter into bringing in survivors only to transform them against their will to quench her insatiable desire for knowledge. In fact, it's possible that she could have experimented on herself as well. When we find her in the clinic after the blood moon is revealed, she convulses, relishing the change taking place within her. God, I'm nauseous. Have you found this? It's progressing. I can see things. I knew it. I'm different. I'm no beast. God, it feels awful, but it proves that I'm chosen. Don't you see how they writhe, writhe inside my head? It's rather rapturous. Once killed, she reveals one-third of an umbilical cord, which reads, Provost Willem sought the cord in order to elevate his being and thoughts into those of a great one, by lining his brain with eyes. The only choice he knew if man were to ever match their greatness. It makes you wonder if the note downstairs in Uden Chapel isn't written by her as well, seeing as she replaces the real Yosefka after you arrive and the way she describes her body movement. The Bergenworth spider hides all manner of rituals and keeps our lost master from us. A terrible shame. It makes my head shudder uncontrollably. Despite the group's importance, there are only a few confirmed members of the choir that we encounter. The first is Yurie, the last scholar. We encounter her at Bergenworth, swiftly attacking us as we climb the stairs to the second floor. She wears the choir set and does battle using methods that are directly connected to the Left Behind Great One namely A Call Beyond and the Augur of Abriatus. One of the secret rites of the choir. 
Long ago, the healing church used phantasms to reach a lofty plane of darkness, but failed to make contact with the outer reachers of the cosmos. The rite failed to achieve its intended purpose, but instead created a small exploding star, now a powerful part of the choir's arsenal. At times, failure is the mother of invention. While a call beyond beckons the cosmos, the auger physically summons part of Briatus. Remnant of the eldritch truth encountered at Bergenworth, use phantasms, the invertebrates known to be the augurs of the Great Ones, to partially summon abandoned Abriatus. The initial encounter marked at the start of inquiry into the cosmos from within the old labyrinth, and led to the establishment of the choir. Yurie bears the title, The Last Scholar. The choir's roots are planted in Bergenworth, and Yurie is the last student to gain its knowledge directly. The last character confirmed to be a part of this sect is choir intelligencer Edgar, who we exchange blows with in the Nightmare of Mensis. The word intelligencer infers that he's working as a spy, which suggests both the connections and tensions between the choir and the school of Mensis. For such an important group, not many related characters appear in game. It's a testament to their secrecy. One more curious detail is the Altar of Despair, the setting where we first meet Abriatus. After defeating her, the option opens up to bring Annalise's queenly flesh to it while following Alfred's quest. When presented, it initiates the message, Time has flowed in reverse for this scrap of flesh. Although any correlation between the altar and Canehurst is unknown and could really have been an unfinished part of the game, the Blood Queen's revival ironically runs counter to the church executioner's intentions to kill vile bloods. Upon returning to the castle, Annalise is alive again, speaking to us as if nothing had happened. Of all the mysteries in Bloodborne, Ebriatus and the choir are among the most captivating. What strikes me about the Left Behind Great One is that by design, she's the archetypical tentacle monster that's made to strike fear into the player and prey upon his or her fear of an unknown creature. From Software flips that on its head by imbuing her with some very human expressions, grief, sadness, and a genuine reluctance to fight. They've taken an alien creature and breathed a depth of emotion into her that anyone can identify with. As understated as she and the choir are, the entire narrative centers around their union, their discovery, and what exists in the vast universe is closer than we think, unfathomable but real. As they say, the sky and the cosmos are one. <laughs>